three things I misunderstood about Christ's sacrificial work. When I grew up, <clears throat> looking back now, I realize how skewed Calvary was in my mind in Sunday school, Bible college, and how skewed I taught what happened at Calvary. The first thing that I have here for us is that I misunderstood its success. You know, I used to talk about, you know, the last words of Christ on the cross, it is finished. But in some ways, I didn't really understand it being finished. It was this ongoing work again that was an offer and that hopefully Christ would get as many people as he could. He's doing the best he could. God was doing the best he could. I used to hear in those days that God was God is a gentleman. I don't, I don't really remember that verse. <laughs> but I'd hear about it. God is a gentleman and he will never force himself on anyone. And that's the whole beauty of free will. Is that God is a gentleman. And he will not force himself on anyone. And then he gives every person a free will. But then somehow, after you die, he takes your free will away. Because who wants to go to hell? You know, you think... You think if people were being cast into hell, they'd say, oh, wait a minute, I changed my mind. <laughs> this is not my will anymore. You know? I don't know where free will went there. But God is a gentleman. Oh, we're going to talk about, we're, we're Christ now, so maybe I'm, pay, I'm paving the way for uh, our last talk. Who God really is. And I don't know any verse says he's a gentleman, but I, I got some really good verses that tell us what he is. You know, and the greatest, the most definitive statement of the scripture about who God is is that God is love. And uh, love, love's not too concerned about being a gentleman when your loved ones are at risk. And if you're all powerful and all knowing and sovereign, there is not a there's not a problem here. It's just when you have a deficient God. And so the first thing I I, I misunderstood was the success of Calvary. That in fact was that we had already mentioned. that John 4, 42 says that he's the savior of the world. That's what I believe. Previously, I believed he was the potential savior. Romans 5, 18. Look, look at it with me. Um, I'm going to read it to you put it here in my notes from the King James because that's the way I would have read it. My main go-to Bible is the concordant version. We have those over there. It's a literal translation. Um, and some other great literal translations, the Devar, Young's, Rotherham. But, so I'm a Baptist preacher and I'm preaching through the book of Romans and I come to this verse. I'd always come across tricky verses and I'd 
dig out my commentaries. See what the commentators had to say about it. Because I don't know what it says. I don't, I don't understand it. And it says this, Therefore, as by the offense of one, okay, I knew who that one was, that's Adam, judgment came upon all men. To condemnation. Even so, even, just like, when you're at the ball game, they say the score is even. That means you got seven points on this side, and how many points on this side? Seven. One man's sin, Adam, all are judged and condemned. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men to justification of life. What? I never, I never heard that before. Who snuck that verse in there? <laughs> Who did that? One man sinned. How many became sinners? All. All. One man, by one righteous act, and how many became righteous? All. I was seeing that the same all that were condemned in Adam are the same all that were justified in Christ. Whoa! That's, a, that's something different. You know what that is? That's success. Now the whole basis of the, the title that as Stephen gave it uh, to me, who is greater, Adam or Christ? Well, I actually misunderstood Christ, uh, Adam to be greater than Christ. Because Adam in the garden sinned against God and it affected the entire of humanity. Jesus came and he did a work. We get about 5%. Wow. I tell you what. Now I'm gonna speak as a man, use a little sarcasm here. What kind of God comes up with a plan like that? <laughs> it don't even make sense. Even if he was on, even if he only had foreknowledge, then why would you even make it? and torture billions and billions of people that you knew. You said, well, he gave them a chance. Oh. This is not even... Oh, I came to realize a successful Savior who always did his Father's will. The Savior of the world. the Savior of all. Success. Adam is not greater than Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is greater than Adam. Because Adam wasn't in a state of righteousness. He said, Christ brought us to a place better than Adam's before he fell. What a glorious truth. We see this also in 1 Corinthians 15, 22. Now, 
I like someone, uh, uh, I think it was uh, 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 Will, who was saying earlier, he said he's a little foggy to him exactly how he got here. You know, to, to learn of these things. And I get that. There's so many pieces of the puzzle that God uses, you know. And the same with me. But as best I remember, this is like one of the second verses that I, the second verse that I remember got me. And it says, For as in Adam all die. And again, this would have been the Bible I would have been reading. It's the King James. And it says, Even so. There's that even thing in as in Adam all die, also, even in Christ, shall all be made alive. Oh, I realize the exact same all who die in Adam are the exact same all who are alive in Christ. And by the way, that's what we're looking for, right? Humanity's dying. Wages of sin is death. I told Adam, you know, you eat this fruit, its result is death. So what do we need? Resurrection. We get resurrection in Christ. How many? All? Wow. Christ undoes. The book where I deal with that is called The Undoing of Adam. Jesus undid what Adam did. In fact, it's far greater than that, which we describe in the book. And there's, there's, a, there's a free stuff there that nothing will be lost. Nothing will be lost. Help yourself to those. Now some people say, well, well, let's just say it this way. Who of us in this room asked or asked if they wanted to be a sinner? Remember that first Understood salvation to be an offer? Well, how about being lost? Being a sinner? Anybody offer you that? God said, okay. I'm thinking about making some people. How many would like to be a sinner? Raise your hand if you'd like to be one. <laughs> okay. Here's what you need to know. You didn't ask for this. Nobody on the planet asked for this. Nobody has to be born a sinner. Paul said that we were, that we're under, we've been subjected to vanity, not willingly. Against our will, we've been subjected. And vanity, I know you think of vanity, you think of, uh, you know, oh, you're so vain. Um, but it's, it's, it's purposelessness, it's, it's frustration. It's inability to to do things that that your heart is on. It, it 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 is. It's despair. No one asked for this. No one signed up for it. And you look at the you look at what would appear to be the worst conditions on the planet, whether they whatever they might be individual or groups of people and they didn't ask for this. No one signed up for this. It was against our will. Adam sinned and we're all in a body of corruption. Paul calls it a body of the body of our humiliation. It's as you know the older you get, the more you appreciate how humiliating your body can be. You know, we go from diapers to diapers. You know, from drooling to drooling. Okay? We've been subjected to sin. We've been subjected to death. We've been subjected to vanity, all against our will. Why? One man was responsible for that. Adam. The good news is no one signs up for salvation. It's the same guarantee of the act of one for all. It's awesome. 
It's truly glorious. It is a success. Now this next thing. The nature of what happened at Calvary. This is big, by the way. Not only was Jesus Christ's work successful. I know you don't see it yet. And that's okay. You know. You don't always see good things that are coming. You know. You don't know what's in your Christmas presents and your birthday <laughs> presents. And, you know. You don't know. It's a part of the joy of the person who's given you stuff. You know? It's coming. Can't hardly wait. How many days left? That's okay. But but what actually happened at Calvary? I misunderstood that. What happened that day at Calvary. Here, I'm going to tell you the gospel of Calvary as I understood it as a little boy and as a pastor for 20 years, I want to explain to you how I understood it and would have told people. God is a holy, righteous God. That's sort of the way I do it, you know. <laughs> and He can't stand the presence of sin. He won't even look at it. And you sin against Him. And you're going to die and you're going to go to hell and pay for your sins. But God's got an offer. And it has to do with Calvary. And at Calvary, God poured all your sins on Jesus. And he took out all his wrath and all his anger on Jesus. And everything that you see at Calvary is shows you what God thinks of you and your sin and who you are. And God pours out all his wrath on his son and he beats his son and he kills his son on Calvary so that he doesn't have to be angry with you. And he doesn't have to pour out his wrath on you. And so he was there as your substitute. He took your place that day so that you don't have to pay. And if you'll accept this offer, God will love you. He loves you. That's why he did this. That's why he beat Jesus up for you. And so that day, almost 2,000 years ago, when God turned out the lights, poured out that anger. And you'll never have to face that. Because he loves you that much. But if you don't accept the offer, you're going to go to hell. And burn forever. In fact, I, I had an older saintly minister who seemed gentle in nature. And his gospel presentation was he would meet people and he'd say, you can trust Christ or you can go to hell. Well, that is what we believed. Wow. You know, there's a, I start to say there's a couple problems with that picture of what happened at Calvary. A couple is, a, is an understatement. What happened at Calvary? Let me read you this one verse. Here's the problem with evangelical view of Calvary. Is that it plots God against His own Son who's standing as a buffer between us. 
and receiving all that anger. When I have a verse that says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, for God was in Christ. For God was in Christ. A couple of cool things about that. And say, for God was Christ. Or Christ was God. But God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Not imputing, not recording their trespasses against them. Oh my God. Is that that's success? First of all, that's success. It doesn't say God was in Christ reconciling believers to himself. He's reconciling the world to himself. Not writing down their sins. You know, I lived I lived a childhood that repenting and confessing your sins was you know this ongoing thing it's like you have a you know we to use the old illustration you got a slate which is a a little blackboard and God's writing your sins down every day and then when you go to bed at night you better clean the slate with God because I'll tell you what even though now and I'm going to be a little sarcastic here and irreverent and God's writing down your sins and at the end of the day if you don't get them squared away with him he's gonna be pissed at you he's gonna be pissed at me and things aren't gonna go well because you know that anger he poured out on Jesus he's liable to bring it all back up again and so what it is God 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 is trying to get at us. He's so mad because he's holy and righteous. That's the way holy and righteous looks like. <laughs> it looks mad and vengeful. And it's trying to get to us. And Jesus keeps stepping in between. No, 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 no. Hit me. Hit me. Hit me. Hit me. I'll take it. Hit me. Hit me. Is that what happened at Calvary? No. God was in Christ. It's not God and Christ is separate. And 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 God beating up Jesus. God was in Christ and, he's, and it's being successful. And so the nature, listen, the nature of Calvary is not substitution. The nature of Calvary is sacrifice. God was sacrificing His Son. When the sacrifices were made in the Old Testament, nobody's angry with the Lamb. Nobody's pissed at the Lamb. Nobody's beating the Lamb up. It's a sacrifice. Something of value is being given up. And this is the glorious, the glorious thing of the concordant version. Over and over. I think it, uh, I had it down here somewhere. I'm sure in my notes. But uh, I think maybe 300 times that the concordant version uses the, the phrase approach present. Because all through the Old Testament, if you wanted access to God, you would bring him a gift, a present, that would allow you to have access. That's because that's the way it always worked with kings and people who were, had majesty. You'd bring them presents as an offering to gain access to them. And then at Calvary, everything about the sacrificial of the Old Testament turned completely around. And now the God of the universe is the one bringing the sacrifice. And he's the one trying to gain access to us. Not trying to. He's the one gaining access by his sacrifice to us. It's not substitution. It's sacrifice. I misunderstood the nature. What's happening at Calvary is not divine appeasement it's divine approach him coming to humanity 
Jesus Christ there joined humanity. And the sin was put on him so he would be a member of humanity. He died as a full member of humanity. His death, burial, and resurrection. He joined us in death and burial and resurrection so that we too might enjoy the relationship they have with the Father. Oh. So if you begin to see something different at Calvary, it's not, it's not God's anger at Calvary. It's His love that He would give. For God, listen, for God was so angry that He beat and killed His only begotten Son. No. For God so loved the world that He gave. Paul said, for the great love that he had for us. God was in love with us. That's what Calvary's about. It's not about him being angry and mean with us. I misunderstood the, the scope of the work. And when I say scope, you know, I have a book up there, The Salvation of All. It doesn't say the salvation of all mankind. The salvation of all humanity. The salvation of all. Because Paul reveals to us in his final epistles of the secret administration, Ephesians and Colossians, he reveals to us that the work of Calvary was far larger than humanity. He says in Colossians 1.20, And having made th peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all unto himself. By him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse uh, 10 says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven and which are in earth even in heaven. What, we may, what may not be superficially apparent to us is that the issue that humanity has been having for all these millennia is not limited to humanity. It actually goes above humanity and below humanity, this alienation that God's creation has with himself. The heavens are filled with wickedness as well. And there is alienation between the celestial beings and God. And according to Paul, the work at Calvary is the solution to that remedy as well as ours. And shall I also tell you that it goes below us as well. That's why I love these verses that just say all. As in Adam... What dies? All. Let's say all man. You know, I've had some beloved pets who died. Why they die? Why? It all goes back to Adam's fall. You know what Adam had? Adam had dominion over everything that moved and lived. And he took the whole dominion with him down. And we watch our little beloved pets die. And you know how I know that? Paul said in Romans chapter 8, For we know that the whole creation groans and travails together in pain. Oh, look. Look what's coming. See what's coming? Woo! No, good things are ahead. <laughs> the best is yet to come. Amen. Listen. Uh, let everything, listen. Let everything that hath breath. 
Then say, let every man, let everything that hath breath, praise the Lord. And every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess. It's the whole of God's creation. Some people call this universal reconciliation. Now there are some people who use that term and they have their doctrines messed up. And that's exactly what's going to happen. The universe, the heavens and the earth and everything that breathes, God is going to restore. Oh my goodness. we got some great stuff to talk about in the next two lessons. It's hard not to talk about them now. But let me tell you what I thought 1 Corinthians 15, 22 said. For it, as an Adam all die. So if, if it's dying, it's, it's on Adam. Even so in Christ shall all. So everything that's dying in Adam is going to be made alive in Christ. Here's, here's what I thought the verse every time I used to read it and preach it. For as in Adam all die, even so also all those who are in Christ shall be made alive. I don't know if you notice that little twist there. So my gospel message was if you want to be saved, you've got to get out of Adam and into Christ. And all those who are in Christ will be made alive. The verse doesn't say that. The verse says, in Adam, all die. In Christ, not all those who are in Christ. In Christ, all will be made alive. And by the way, that word's better than alive. We're not just talking about, you know, Lazarus we talked about in uh, the last lesson. You know what happened to him? I, I'm not talking about the story of the rich man Lazarus. I'm talking about the, the, uh, the uh, brother of Mary and Martha. What, what happened to him after he was raised? Well, much later. Who knows how long. I'm just trying to say he died again. Because his resurrection was resuscitation. He was given life again. There's a better word than that in the Greek. There's something better than just breathing again. We can do that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, whoo! And then we say, I am the resurrection. <laughs> Doctors can do that. They can resuscitate you. There's a word, the concordant translates it vivify, vivify. And actually that's what it says in that verse, right? And in Christ shall all be vivified, which is life beyond the reach of death. That's called immortality. And there's only one person who has immortality right now. Paul said, who only hath immortality in life. Who is it? Jesus. He's the only one who's made it. All the way to the vivification. But he's our head. He said, you know what? We're going to do this together. I'm going to die. We're going to die together. And then I'm going to get up. And I'm going to ascend. And I'm the first fruit. And here we go. We're going to get there. You know? And in the meantime, you know, our loved ones are sleeping. And that's okay. You know, I, I had a family member tell me one time, he understood the <coughs> traditional view of death. And they said, uh, oh, they were really struggling with dying. And I'm talking to them. I said, what, you know, talk to me about it. I said, I'm going to miss everybody. I don't think I can take it. I'm going to miss everybody. I can't imagine missing everybody. I said, oh, you're not going to miss anybody. You know, just sleeping, you know. When you're, when you're young, when you're young, you fight sleep. You know, got to take a nap. 
Who wanna take a nap? The older you get, ah, uh, you start loving naps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh my gosh, is it time for a nap yet? Yeah. Oh my gosh. So I say every morning when I wake up. I'd be, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to embarrass myself and tell you what time I go to bed. Sometimes. Ah, uh, it's ah. Uh, you just get. You just like I can't. I just can't go anymore. I don't have anything left. I don't know how many days I end that way. It's like, oh, uh, I don't have anything left. And then with welcoming arms, I go and crawl in my bed, and I don't know anything until I awake. That's a really nice place to be. It's a really wonderful place. The story of heathenism sounds good, but it's not. And one of these days, Andy and I were talking earlier about, and I used, I've heard this said before, you know, when Jesus went to the tomb of Lazarus, he didn't say, come out. He'd have got everybody out. <laughs> he said, Lazarus. You know what Job said? He said he was going to hear his Redeemer call. And he's going to get up. He was waiting for the morning. Little kids sleeping in the bed. Wake up. Wake up. And guess what? Oh. And just like your wife and your grandmother, she wanted this to be. You were just right there with her. You were just right there. And now you're just all together. Oh, what a wonderful thing that is. Just right there. Death's, all, death's, death's hard on us. You know? Oh, my goodness. Anyway, okay. Who's greater? Christ or Adam? Oh, Adam, yeah, he's pretty powerful. God gave him a pretty powerful place. But God gave Christ. In the resurrection, what did it say? Power in heaven and earth over all things. Yeah, Christ is much more successful than that. All right, we're going to take a break. We're going to... Uh,